thinking in my mind if this professor's there and saying right and wrong are just an illusion and they do not exist. Uh, what's right is right from one person to another. What's wrong is wrong from one person. I wonder what he would say if somebody came up in the middle of him saying that and just kicked him in the nuts. <laughs> Well, hello, and welcome to another clear-eyed, full-hearted, can't-lose episode of On the Journey with Matt and Ken. I'm Matt Swaim, along with my colleague Ken Hensley, and we are with the Coming Home Network. Come visit us at chnetwork.org. Ken was a Baptist pastor. I was an evangelical. It's always hard to figure out how to explain what I was. But at any rate, we both ended up Catholic, and uh, we've explained that in, uh, what, like 65 Mm -hmm. other episodes, if you want to know why. But today, we're getting into some... I guess you could say more basic questions, which is why we are theists at all. So, Ken, how you doing? I'm I'm doing well. Just got back from vacation, feeling great. How are you? I I could use a vacation. We'll see. Uh, Go ahead, see take that, one. We'll see if that just, ever, just don't that ever Just don't take one. Just don't take one before we're done recording this. Yeah, I won't take one in the next forty five minutes. Okay. By the way, come visit Ken and I in the community, the online community, community.chnetwork.org. That's a whole group of people who have these kind of conversations all the time and Ken we are switching topics we're going to talk a little we're bit talking about-, about yeah we're going to talk about apologetics yeah yeah, yeah. And let me be- begin by saying that I have personally been deeply involved in apologetics study of Christian apologetics from the very beginning in fact I don't know if you know this map but the very first book uh Christian book that I ever read was a book of Christian apologetics um, if you can imagine it, it's many, many, many years ago. I was at a junior high winter camp, probably, I don't know, 12 years old, something like that. And I wandered into the bookstore and I was just fishing around on this rack. I saw this little book with a with a devil on the front, this crazy picture of a devil. And, and I remember thinking, wow, that's pretty cool. I'll pick that up. So I bought the book. I went out into the forest and I found this big boulder. I climbed up onto the boulder and I was sitting there and started reading it. Turns out it was the screw tape letters is what I was reading. Now, at 12 years old, I mean, I don't think I understood even 5% of what the guy was writing, but I was reading C.S. Lewis, screw tape letters, and I remember thinking to myself, this guy's really bright. You know, whatever he's saying here, it's really, really good, okay? So that was the first thing I ever read. And now I, and I remember feeling like uh, that I was a Christian, that I had faith in Christ at that time. Um I drifted off from that. As a teenager, I got involved in music, as you know, as you did as well. And I became like a rock and roll guy, and I didn't have anything to do with religion or God or Christ, really, for a num- number of years. But when my best friend Bob um, came to Christ, I was just turning, I was 21, turning 22 at the time. And he and I began to take some long walks and to talk about his conversion. My number one concern then, again, when I look back, was apologetics. It was all right. I can see that you're you're happier than you were before. This is all sounds great, but what I care about is is it really true? And so um, from from the beginning, then Matt, I was suddenly reading more of C.S. Lewis, reading the wonderful Josh McDowell. You remember that book with the big cross on the front? Was it that and, uh, evidence and, uh, that demands a verdict, something like that. Yeah, the yeah the judge's ga- gavel sitting on top of a cross. Well, there's the and, case for Christ. Uh, Lee Strobel came out a little bit later than that. Some others. The sort of yeah. the basic yeah. New York Times bestseller yeah. Christian apologetics works out there. Yeah, and so the the point that I'm just making here in introduction really is that from the beginning of my life as a Christian, which has been 45 years now, I have been reading extensively in the area of apologetics, not just Catholic Protestant apologetics, but all kinds. It's something very near and dear to me. It's something I focused on and thought about a lot. And you and I now, for over a year, believe it or not, we've been doing essentially Protestant Catholic apologetics. We've been talking about, uh, we've been relating our stories. That is the some of the reasons we had for abandoning our um, profession as Protestants to become Catholic, and we're going to continue doing that. After all, the show is titled "On the Journey with Matt and Ken," and we mean by that "on the journey into the Catholic Church." But I want to take a little bit of a break here and do something different, um, and so a series on. Um, 
how I go about sharing uh, or doing apologetics, doing evangelism with people who doubt or deny the very existence of God. That's yeah. what I want to get into for a while. Well, here's what I don't want to happen, Ken. Um, I don't want people to get the impression that we're doing something with this series that we're not actually doing. We're not doing what Josh McDowell was doing or what Lee Strobel was doing uh, in trying to say, mm. you know, here are you know, the exact proofs that God exists. And if you don't accept these proofs, then you reject God. Uh, I don't want people to watch this video and then send it to their atheist or agnostic friend and say, watch this and 45 minutes later, you will be a theist, <laughs> right? Because that's not even necessarily what we're trying to do here. We're trying to kind of, I guess, revisit this conversation that is just a blazing hot battle in so many comment boxes on YouTube videos between atheists and Christians who just seem to talk past yeah. one another and maybe have like a bit of a more like what's what's the question behind the question that a lot of people are asking when they are engaging with this topic? Yeah, I, um, another way that I could say what, what, what you're saying is is that at least for me, what I'm wanting to do here is is share more the mindset that I have and the approach that I take personally. Um, when evangelizing, when when sitting down and having a discussion with someone who says that they don't believe in God, my evangelistic approach. Now it is apologetics, and it's going to become more and more apologetics as we, as we go along. But yeah, you're right. We're not presenting Aquinas's five proofs, and I'm not sitting here and trying to present um, all of the scientific information that someone you know that someone like uh, Father Robert Spitzer or John Lennox of Oxford gives when he when he debates it's a very different thing but anyway let's back up a little bit then you and i do live at a time when the number of those who would identify as atheist or at minimum agnostic um, is really really appears to be rising especially among young people i'll say especially in the west but i i think that it's global too and i would say it's not surprising um, given the basic worldview that is communicated in our public education system, um, throughout Hollywood and all TVs and movies and all that. I mean, throughout, God is simply not present. I was thinking about this the other day. You watch movies, you watch TV shows, and it's not as though the show's coming out and saying, hey, God doesn't exist and here's our argument. God is just not there, you know what I mean? You know, life is just carried on as though God doesn't exist. And so this is just sort of an assumed worldview in which we live now. Um, if you look at social media, it's not going to take long to encounter the rabid d disciples of the militant and mocking new atheists, uh, men like Richard Dawkins, who wrote The God Delusion, Christopher Hitchens, the late Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, Daniel Dennett are some of the main names. Um, you've got Bill Maher on TV, you know, snickering um, at the childishness, really, of those who believe in a God and then we continually hear, for whom there is no evidence. You know, yeah, God. and Marr, who has a specific distaste for Catholics, who says that, you know, why should he listen to anybody uh, like us who mm -hmm. thinks that we drink the blood of a 2,000-year-old space god? Uh, you know, these are some of these people are yeah. very, very nasty and spiteful, uh, but a lot of people who um, adhere to these, you know, worldviews, mm -hmm. uh, it's not because they've read Richard Dawkins and he's like changed their life. A lot of people just live with no point of reference to God whatsoever because they've mm -hmm. never had any reason to have a point of reference, have a point of reference to God. Yeah. Is this part of the, is, is this, is this in the air? Uh, you know, you know, in our short series on the Reformation, we talked about the atmosphere that it was, cre that was created in the decades leading up to the Reformation that, that made the Reformation almost inevitable. Well, in, in a similar way, there's an atmosphere in which we live now, and this is not something that that re, that relates only to popular culture. Atheism has become more and more dominant in academia as well. Here's a quotation from Christian apologist Philip Johnson that kind of hit me when I first read it. He says, and I quote, the most influential intellectuals in America and around the world are mostly naturalists who assume that God exists only as an idea in the minds of religious believers. In our great universities, naturalism, that is the doctrine that nature is all there is, is the virtually unquestioned assumption that underlies not only the natural sciences, but intellectual work of all kinds. And, you know, just take a, take a, a moment to absorb what he's saying here, Matt. 
I mean, the doctrine that nature is all there is, he says, has become the virtually unquestioned assumption. Yeah. It, not just not 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 just in the natural sciences, but in philosophy and history across the board. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's interesting. You know, of course, the late Norm Macdonald, the late great Norm Macdonald, passed away um, not long ago, just a matter of days um, prior to the recording of this particular episode. And Norm was one of those guys who, you know, he joked and he you know, kind of had a, a funny take on life and and the world. But he also had mm-hmm. kind of this question uh, of, you know, what is it? What what is my end? What am I made for? Uh, and I remember hearing a podcast of his um, where he was having yeah. a discussion with a comedian friend saying something to the effect of like, uh, if there is some question as to whether or not there is anything after this life. Why is science not focusing every single aspect of its energy <laughs> into looking into this question, right? Like, this is kind of the thing. Yeah. Okay, here's the here's the one thing we know. We don't know exactly how long it's going to be till you know, we land on, you know, some planet in another mm-hmm. s- galaxy that can sustain life. We all know that we're going to die. Why aren't we working on that question about what happens next? Why is, why is that the yeah. question that we can't really talk about? Yeah, I watched that video, too, because you shared it, I think, a week ago or two weeks ago. It was good. Yeah. Very funny guy, too. So the question that I'm asking here is, how do we who believe in God, that it, how, how do we who know Christ and who believe in God, how do we approach those who doubt or deny outright the existence of God? And I, I guess as I say these words, I realize that what, what I'm kind of presenting here today is sort of a Christian anthropology, some parts of it or Christian psychology even, because uh, here's where it starts for me, Matt. That is, when I sit down for a, for a bottle of beer or a cup of coffee or something with someone who believes, who really believes that nature is all there is, or who assumes that, what I do is I begin by reminding myself of some of the important things I know or I believe as a Christian. Um, what do I believe about this person sitting across the table from me? This is a question I, I want to have a clear answer in my mind. And I don't mean, what do I believe about them specifically? Like, um, you know, is he a, is he a, you know, a bowling champion or, you know, or, or what, you know, does he throw darts on the weekend? What I mean is, what do I believe about who this person is as created by God, this person sitting in front of me? And what do I believe about the world in which we both live? This is where I begin. And here are four things that I want to have in mind when I sit down for this conversation that I, am, that I do have in mind. And we can kind of run through these fairly quickly, I think. First of all is this. The Word of God teaches me that creation cries out the existence of God, that the created order gives evidence everywhere of the God who made it, of the God who designed it. I immediately think of Psalm 19, verses 1 through 3, where we read, The heavens declare the glory of God, the psalmist said. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they display knowledge. There is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words go out to the ends of the world. Okay, now, of course, the atheist is going to deny that creation gives evidence of a creator, obviously. In, in fact, in his famous book, The Blind Watchmaker, Richard Dawkins claims, and I'm quoting him now, that, quote, the universe we observe has precisely the properties we should expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Okay? So the atheist is going to deny what I'm saying, but 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 my point here is my focus here is not on what the atheist thinks or what the atheist believes. My focus here, my concern is with what I believe as a Christian about the atheist, all right? And what I believe is that creation speaks of God's existence and nature. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands that it speaks of this God continually. I love how it says, day after day they pour forth speech, night after night they display knowledge. And I believe that this creation, that is the message of creation, reaches every person. Again, quoting the psalm, there is no speech or language where their voice is not heard. Their voice goes out into all the earth, their words to the ends of the world. In other words, In other words, what I believe as I sit at the table to share a cup of coffee again with my atheist friend, what I believe is that this person sitting across the table from me lives in a world 
that literally cries out the existence of the God who fashioned it, whatever he thinks, whatever he says. I know I've shared this in other uh, arenas, and I don't know if I've shared it in this particular program that we do, uh, but you know, I, you and I both work with a, a hermit named Brother Rex Anthony Norris. Uh, who's yes. based up in Maine, and he was a firefighter and a whole bunch of other things before he uh, ended up um, a believer and eventually a Catholic and then a hermit. But uh, he shares a story, and I cannot remember where it was. It might have been at the Grand Canyon. Uh, mm-hmm. He's going to watch this, and he's going to correct me <laughs> later on. Uh, but when he was living as though there were no God, and he walked and saw like a sunset over the Grand Canyon or wherever it was, and he had this epiphany, yeah. and he was like, this is glorious and i have nobody to thank for it <laughs> right oh, and yeah, uh, yeah. and that was kind of like a gut punch uh you know moment for him like mm-hmm. i'm grateful but i don't have an object i don't have anybody mm-hmm. to say thank you to uh, and that was kind of a, mm-hmm. a piece of it for him um that, that either yeah it yeah. really did mean nothing or maybe it did mean something and maybe he needed to think about it. It, the creation was crying out uh yeah you know, about the creator right there in front of him. And he was trying to figure out, what do I do with that? Oh, there are so many things. I mean, and there's so many directions to go with this, uh, but I'll but I'll leave it for now. Okay, point one is, is simply that. This is what scripture teaches me. This is what I have in my mind when I sit down to talk. This is what I know, that my friend here, whatever he says, whatever she says about the nature of the universe, lives in a universe that cries out the existence of God. Okay, scripture also teaches me, this, this is point number two, that my atheist friend is himself the most eloquent argument that, that exists for God's existence, okay? My atheist friend is himself the most eloquent argument. Why? Well, because my atheist friend has been created in the image and likeness of God. That is, he has been created to be a mirror of the God who made him, to be a mirror of God's being, God's attributes. As a conscious personal being, for instance, He reflects the conscious personal nature of the God who created him. As a moral being, he reflects the fact that God is a moral being. As a rational being, my friend reflects the rational nature of the God who made him. As a being with free will, as a being who loves, as a being who desires. um, in, In all of these ways, my friend reflects the being and nature of God. And so it turns out, I mean, as ironic as it may seem, that while my friend is denying the very existence of God, he's sitting there as the most eloquent argument for God's existence that could possibly exist. In fact, that does exist in this entire universe. He's what I like to call, he's a walking, talking, living, breathing advertisement for God's existence. This is something else I want to have in mind. Yeah, even if he's a terrible person, right? He's still yeah. a walking, yeah. talking billboard for God's existence because he has the ability yeah. to to think and breathe and create art and love and perhaps have offspring uh, who he can teach us to walk and hunt yeah, so, and gather, so as but ironic, also, yeah. you know, also to like read and write and dream and yeah, yeah, create, you know. All those ways. And so, you know, I use the word ironic, but sad too, as ironic and sad as it is, here's someone living in a universe that shouts out the existence of God, who himself shouts out the existence of God with every aspect of his being, really, um, and and yet who is saying there is no God. Yeah. Does Um, a hamster walk around, uh, you know, in his little tunnels, thinking about whether or not there's a God? You know, does a snake... Does a catfish yeah. or a bat, uh, even the fact that he's allowed to, you know, or, or able to process the question, right, proves yeah, that he's and, on a different level than like uh, beetles different. and slugs and vultures. Yeah, in and fact, stuff. someone I know, someone I know gave the illustration one time. He said it's like imagine two children in their backyard sitting on the swing set. Uh, they're swinging back and forth on this swing set. Um, they can hear the sound of the lawnmower as dad's out mowing the front lawn. They can smell hot dogs cooking in the kitchen. And, and they're debating with one another whether, whether or not a mother or a father possibly exists. <laughs> you know, you know. Okay, uh, number, th- num- number three is this. Scripture also teaches me that the message of creation is a message that gets through. 
that at some level everyone knows the God who made them. Okay, listen to this. This is from St. Paul writing in Romans chapter 1, uh, verses 18 through 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which may be known about God is evident to them for God has made it evident to them for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. So, you know, according to St. Paul, then God's existence, God's divine nature are evident. They are, these are the words he uses and phrases. They're clearly seen. Uh, they're being understood through what has been made. In, in fact, Paul says that in order for fallen man to dull this knowledge, in order for sinful fallen human being to dull this knowledge and to erase it from his mind entirely, he has to engage in a form of suppression. That is, he has to be suppressing the evidences that are all around him. Again, Paul says, you know, the wrath of God is revealed against those who suppress the truth because that which may be known about God is evident. God has made it evident to them. In other words, they have to suppress the truth. And, and what this teaches me, there's no chance that my atheist friend has, hasn't looked at a gorgeous sunset at some point and given thanks, even if he didn't know who he was given thanks to. There's just no chance that he has, if he's a father, that he has looked at the face of his newborn daughter or you know, played catch with his, with his little boy in the front yard and not seen the glory of God and not understood it. There is no chance. I'm talking to someone who at some level already knows the God that I want to talk about. And, you know, the situation was a little bit different in Paul's time because Paul lived in a world where everybody believed in some kind of something, right? Uh, and yeah. uh, there are a lot of people now who have had it kind of erased from their formation uh, that they just have never had uh, the idea mm -hmm. of God as a point of reference to begin with because generations before them have kind of eradicated that. But correct me if I'm wrong. I, maybe this is out there and I've just not come across it. Ken, do you, have you ever heard the story in any missionary lore ever, um, Protestant, Catholic, any kind of missionary lore ever, where someone went out and found some people group that nobody had ever spoken to before uh, from their Arabia. civilization. And they made that first contact yeah. and they began to share a little bit of their faith. And the yeah, response yeah. of these people was, what do you mean there's a supernatural world? No, <laughs> there's never been a case that I've ever heard of. Like, no matter where people have traveled, no matter yeah. what civilizations yeah. have been discovered, right, uh, by the West over the years, everybody has a point of reference to some sort of transcendent supernatural reality, whether that's an animistic one, whether that's yeah. uh, one, you know, that's tied to the cosmos. This is something that... Ever, I mean, yeah. find it, find it. If we were to tomorrow find an island that nobody else outside of that island had known about before, I guarantee you if you asked them, they would have some sort of reference to the supernatural. Yes, yes. And, and I, I, I mean, that that's an important point that basically everyone in the world believes in God. It's, it, it's always been the case that it's a very, very small minority of people who actually don't believe in God. You know, whatever name they attach or whatever conception that they have. Uh, and that's why I, I kind of think it's interesting, by the way, I, I referred to Richard Dawkins' book, The Blind Watchmaker. It's, it's interesting that he says that this world is exactly the kind of world you would expect if there is no God, you know, no morality, no good, no evil, just blind, pitiless indifference. But then he also says in another place that biology, he also defines biology as the study of things that give every appearance of having been designed, <laughs> you, know, you know, so everything looks like it's been designed, he says, you know, he's admitting that. Um, everyone in the world basically no, uh, naturally kind of believes in God, and yet, uh, and yet he wants to argue at the same time that the world has the appearance is exactly what we would expect if there's no God. Well, anyway, um, yeah, you're right. You're right. And that's a good point. Okay. Point four is this then. Okay. So point Point one was a world that screams out the existence of God. Point two was that my atheist friend is his, himself the most eloquent argument for God's existence. Point three was scripture teaches us that this message gets through, that everyone at some level kind of knows. And then the fourth point is this. Scripture teaches me as well 
that my atheist friend desires relationship with God more than anything. St. Augustine put his finger directly upon this when he wrote in his confessions, Lord, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Blaise Pascal also wrote about this in his very famous passage that I love to quote, all men seek happiness, this is without exception. Whatever different means they employ, they all tend to this end. This is the motive of every action of every man, even of those who hang themselves. Everyone, he says, is seeking happiness. And yet he goes on to say, this is Blaise Pascal, all complain, princes and subjects, noblemen, commoners, old, young, strong, weak, learned and ignorant, healthy and sick of all countries, all times, all ages, all conditions. Everyone is complaining that they can't find this happiness. What is it then that this desire and this inability to find happiness proclaim to us? but that there was once in man a true happiness of which there now remained to him only the mark and empty trace, which he in vain tries to fill from all his surroundings, seeking from things absent the comfort he does not receive from things present. But these are all inadequate because the infinite abyss inside of us can only be filled by an infinite and immutable object. That is to say, by God himself. Yeah, yeah, and this uh, this goes back to the Cheryl Crow question, uh, you know, in her song, "If you ma- if it makes you happy, why the hell are you so sad?" <laughs> right? You know, this <laughs> this uh, you know question of just do what you want, right? Uh, the world is out there yeah. to fulfill you, and you know, just do whatever makes yeah. you happy. And everybody who does whatever makes them happy is miserable. They're all miserable, <laughs> you know. Well, see, which of course brings in the the truth of the fallen nature of this world and the whole thing. But this, this truth that is that my atheist friend desires relationship with God. This is such a foundational truth that our catechism, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, actually begins with this truth. You look at Part One of the Catechism, Section One, Chapter One, under the first heading, which is desire for God or the desire for God, and this is what we read. The desire for God is written in the human heart because man is created by God and for God. Now, this kind of summarizes everything we've said. And God never ceases to draw man to himself. Only in God will he find the truth and the happiness he never stops searching for. And so let me put these points all together then. When I sit down to talk with someone who identifies as an atheist or as an agnostic, I'm sitting down with someone who has been confronted really with God's existence all of his life in the beauty of creation. Um, as you said, Brother Rex, you know, uh, in the Grand Canyon or wherever it, it, it ended up being. I mean, in the beauty of creation, he's seen God. He's been he's been seeing God his whole life. In the faces of, uh, of the people he loves, he has seen God's face. And the interesting, he has never even looked into a mirror without seeing the image and likeness of God. Um, He's never looked into his own soul, definitely, without being confronted with the image of God because he's been created to be a mirror of God's image and likeness. That's what he is. And so my friend knows, I would say, in his heart of hearts, he knows that he is more than a mere collection of molecules. He knows this. Some kind of biological machine. He, He knows that he's more than that. According to the Word of God, I'm saying, this is not just my idea, this is what the Word of God teaches us. According to the Word of God, he knows this, and yet, by some path, he's come to believe that there's no God at all. Again, a reference back to Norm MacDonald, watching some of these videos of Norm. There was, Norm was on Larry King Live and having a little bit of these conversations, and Larry was talking, you know, mm-hmm. trying to make this sort of argument for pure natural scientific materialism, and you know, Norm's like, Larry, sounds like you got a God-shaped hole, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he did. He did. Um, but I just yeah. want to point out that, yeah. you know, Ken, you've gotten, you've dug into some really important stuff here, and you've mentioned a little bit of the catechism. I, I, In preparation for this, I tried to find the best chunk that you could possibly read if you want to know where Catholicism is on some of this stuff. And I would say go to paragraphs uh-huh. about 268 to about 421. It is really mm-hmm. meaty. Um, and it digs mm-hmm. into and, and with lots and lots of footnotes Good. and references that kind of like hit on some of the things that you're pointing out right here. But uh, mm-hmm. again, two sixty eight, uh, yeah, two sixty eight to about four twenty one in the Catechism. Okay, now let's move the conversation forward. Okay, uh, what I've been describing here, Matt, are the are the things I want to have in my mind 
that I have in my mind whenever I talk to someone that is about who this person really is, um, that is what I believe about who this person really is, and what I believe about the nature of the world in which we live. Okay, now this has some implications. This tells me something profoundly important. And what it tells me is this. It tells me that my atheist friend is living in continual tension. And this, I want to talk about this for a few minutes and illustrate it. What this tells me is that my atheist friend must be living in a continual tension between who he really is as the image of God and who he would be <laughs> if what he says about the world really was true. Okay, That is, if nature really was all there is, and if he really was nothing more than a biological machine, if he really was nothing more than a bag of protoplasm, a product of nature, okay? What I'm saying is he's living in a tension between who he really is and who he would be if what he says he believes about the world, atheism, really was true. Now, this is a tension that the most thoughtful, I think, of atheist philosophers are aware of. They experience this tension and they struggle like the devil trying to understand how to get around it, how to explain the tension. And I'm, I'm going to quote to you, for instance, from philosopher John Searle, who in, uh, he's an atheist, well, well-known atheist philosopher who until a couple of years ago was professor of the of, um, philosophy of mind at uh, UC Berkeley. This is what he says. There is exactly one overriding question in contemporary philosophy. Okay, now listen up there just real quick. Think about it how he introduces this. He's saying, this is the most important question. There is exactly, exactly one overriding question in contemporary philosophy. How do we fit in? How can we square the self-conception we have of ourselves as mindful, meaning-creating, free, rational agents? How do we square this with a universe that consists entirely of mindless meaningless, unfree, non-rational, brute, physical particles. Okay. Okay. Listen to what he's saying there, Matt. Okay. Just take in what he's saying. He's saying, this is the most important question. I mean, this is the, the overriding question in contemporary philosophy. We don't seem to fit in. On the one hand, we say that the universe consists of nothing but mindless, brute physical particles, you know, just material substances randomly evolving throughout time, particles interacting with one another according to strict chemical and physical laws. On the one hand, we say that, and at the same time, our conception of ourselves just doesn't fit with this at all. We conceive of ourselves as being mindful, meaning creating, that is, we, we believe that life has meaning, we see meaning in things, free, rational agents. Okay, now, I realize, again, coming back to Aquinas' five proofs, I realize that there are great proofs for God's existence, positive arguments for God's existence. In fact, I would encourage everybody, get Ed Fazer's book on, on Aquinas' five proofs. It's a fantastic book. Again, as I mentioned earlier, I love the work of Father Robert Spitzer, John Lennox, and so many others that are presenting positive evidence for the existence of God. But the question that John Searle asks here is the question is a very powerful question and a question that I like to pose or to my atheist friend or I, I like to have that question in my mind when I begin to uh, speak with my atheist friend you know and, and to say in a number of different ways okay we are mindful you're a rational mindful being Matt well the material universe is mindless there's nothing of rationality in the material universe we tend to believe that life has meaning. We tend to see meaning in things. Well, if nothing exists but material particles, again, interacting according to strict physical laws, we live in a massive, meaningless accident that we call the universe. And within that, we're all meaningless as well. So it doesn't fit. We view ourselves as free. The, mere, the material universe is one hopelessly mechanical machine deterministic in every way. We are conscious, rational beings. Well, the universe that the atheist believes in is comprised from top to bottom, as, as John Searle says, with impersonal, non-rational, brute physical particles. How do you square this? Okay, that's what I have in my mind. 
is to ask my atheist friend, how do you square this? Uh, or to say it another way, when I'm doing evangelism, what I'm really doing in this with this method is I'm challenging my atheist friend to make sense of his own experience as a human being in terms of what he says is true of the world in which we live. I'm asking him to defend his naturalist worldview. And what I'm hoping to show him, I'm hoping to show him or to lead him to see that he can't account for the richness of human experience. He can't account for who he is and what he really believes in terms of the worldview that he espouses as an atheist. And, and in fact, I would say that he gives evidence all day long that the worldview he espouses doesn't fit with who he really is. Well, and he would now, do that. Anal- I mean, this is, I, we, I'm not saying yeah. this to, to be nasty to anybody who feels like this uh, or who believes this, uh, but even the fact that I word, use the word feel or believe mm-hmm. shows that I'm using <laughs> uh, terms that have meaning invested in them. But if someone who uh, holds this position uh, has a loved one and that loved one dies, uh, why would it make sense for that person to cry or to be sad? Because what they are doing is trying to read meaning into something that does not actually mean anything at all, right? Objectively speaking, the universe, he would have to say, has no meaning. And objectively speaking, every life that comes into this world has no meaning ultimately. And the very fact that he does cry, the very fact that he doesn't think that way and doesn't feel that way is part of the evidence I'm talking about. Because the way he's feeling and acting fits beautifully with the idea that he's the image and likeness of God. And mm-hmm. that he knows that life is more than that. But, okay, this is a mouthful in kind of describing this. Let, let me illustrate with an analogy what I'm talking about here. Th- this tension that I'm describing. Okay, imagine a scientist, Matt, who says that there's no such thing as gravity. Okay. Okay, imagine he writes books on the non-existence of gravity. He travels the world giving esoteric or, or giving erudite lectures on the non-existence of gravity. Okay, this is what he's come to believe. Okay, this is what he says is true of our world. Gravity does not exist. There's no such thing as gravity or, or anything equivalent to it, all right? At the same time, because this scientist is forced to live in the wor- real world, he's forced to live in, in a world in which gravity does exist or something equivalent to gravity, okay? He ends up giving evidence that his worldview isn't true, that his espoused worldview isn't true. He ends up giving evidence of this literally with every step he takes. You know, as he walks across the platform to give his lecture, his feet keep falling to the floor and he keeps giving evidence that his lecture on the non-existence of gravity isn't true. It, It isn't true. Okay, now, if he, let me drag this out a little, little bit more. If he were to attempt to live um, in a manner consistent with what he says is true of the world, you know, he starts walking off the top of, um, you know, the Empire State Building or something because after all, there's no gravity. Or, you know, he opens the door to an airplane in mid-flight and just like steps right out the side to try and illustrate that there is no gravity. He would, he would find out, he would learn pronto that his worldview has some, there are some problems with it, okay? <laughs> that, it, that it isn't working, all right? Instead though, um, he doesn't do this. Instead, what he does is he ends up living as though gravity exists. He just believes that it doesn't and he just says that it doesn't, okay? He ends up living as though gravity does exist. He just says it doesn't. And, and uh, one step further, the fact that when he gives his wonderful lectures on the non-existence of gravity, the fact that he doesn't bother to glue his notes to the top of the podium, you know, or to chain his feet to the floor, also gives evidence that he, at some level, knows that the contents of his lecture isn't aren't true. Okay, uh, that's the kind of whole picture I'm I'm talking about. I think that this is the position that an atheist finds himself in, as someone created in the image and likeness of God. He says that there's no God. He says that he is nothing more than a biochemical machine, but he cannot live as though this were true. And he he doesn't live as though it's true. And uh, while you're churning up a a nice picture in your mind, let me give you just one illustration of this, because we're going to look at a number of illustrations of this over the coming weeks. But many people are probably listening have probably read C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity. And as he points out in this classic book, except in very rare cases, 
Um, the atheist lives as though he believed in the existence of a moral law. He, he, he's, he begins by talking about the moral law. Um, except in very rare uh, cases, atheists live as though right and wrong were real things. Someone cuts in front of an atheist at the line at the grocery store, and he responds. I mean, he may not respond out loud, but he responds internally. This is unjust. This isn't right. You know, C.S. Lewis is making that argument. Everyone believes in the existence of a moral law. Now, this makes sense within a worldview in which an infinite moral being exists and who created us in his image so that the moral law would be a part of who we really are. That is, moral law actually does exist and we have it reflected in our natures. But if nothing exists but material particles interacting with one another, I mean, literally, if nothing exists but material particles, how does my atheist friend account for the existence of a moral law? In, in that case, wouldn't right and wrong, uh, wouldn't right and wrong be nothing more than words that you and I use to express what we like and what we don't like? There's one illustration of it. And uh, I have a little story. I had an atheist professor when I was in college. It was a psychology class, actually, but he walked into the room, Matt, and he, he, he was giving a le lecture on ethics that day or, or morality. He walks into the room and he literally began his lecture by saying, right and wrong do not exist. He said, morality is relative from person to person. It's relative from culture to culture. Objectively speaking, morality doesn't exist. He said, there are some, he used the word Eskimo at the time, there are some Eskimo tribes where he said, when people, you know, when grandma and grandpa get get really old and they're no, no longer of any use to the society. Just put them on a little block of ice and just, just kind of boot them out into the Bering Strait, <laughs> Straits and that's, that, that's the end of Grandma and Grandpa. And he, he, was, he was quick to say, and who are we to judge? Right and wrong do not exist. Every culture has its own morality. Well, I was sitting in class and I was thinking about these things and I was looking around the room and I was kind of stunned, Matt, at the idea that all of the students in this large le le lecture hall were just studiously taking notes. You know, okay, morality doesn't exist, right and wrong, relative from culture to culture, person to person. I couldn't take it. I, ra I raised my hand and I said, Professor, he called upon me. I said, Professor, I said, then if what you're saying is true, then doesn't that mean that we really can't say that what Hitler did was wrong? I mean, I, I mean the best we can say is that we don't like what Hitler did. I mean, he liked what he was doing. And there were thousands, I guess, millions who agreed with him and liked what he was doing. I mean, the best we can say is that we disagree, that, that we don't like what he liked. And when I raised the question like that, Matt, the professor just sort of stood there like a, a, like, like a deer caught in the headlights. And he actually began to turn a little bit red, like a little bit like red in the face. And he, I'm not exaggerating. He literally began to step backward into the corner of the class, like a couple steps backward. And he thought about it and he said, well, he said, I guess there are some things we agree on enough that it kind of uh, really becomes wrong. Yeah, I'm just wondering, thinking in my mind if this professor's there and saying right and wrong are just an illusion and they do not exist. Uh, what's right is right from one person to another. What's wrong is wrong from one person. I wonder what he would say if somebody came up in the middle of him saying that just kicked him in the nuts. Right. Like, you know, I mean, what would it, how would he react, uh, you know, if that were the case? Right. Uh, or or if someone were to say, well, thanks, Professor, I'm not showing up to class anymore. Right. He would say, but no, wait, you have to show up to my class to get a grade. Right. Uh, like he would have some sense of something. You know, he would he's living a life as though <laughs> these things do oh, exist yeah. while arguing that they do not exist. You know, there's a uh, if you've ever read G.K. Chesterton's uh, short novel, Man Alive, um, there's a man. Uh, Innocent Smith, and, and he's on trial for attempted murder. And it turns out as the story mm -hmm. comes out, and I'm spoiling only one piece of this very lar large picture mm -hmm. that Chesterton's trying to create. Uh, he's in charge, uh, He's charged with the attempted murder of this atheistic professor. And it uh, turns out that this guy shot at the professor. Well, it also turns out that this guy's an extremely good shot. And so they find out as they begin to explore that the two men had been in a debate and the atheistic professor had said that nothing means anything just like your professor had said. And so Chesterton's protagonist got out yeah. the gun and shot at him. And uh, he was shooting at him to basically try and prove to him that he didn't believe his own argument, right? He shot at him and missed on purpose. And of course, the guy who was shot at was like, what are you doing? 
this is on this is this is criminal, you know, what you've done to me. But again, uh, yeah. it's like the guy who would say, you know, go around giving lectures on the fact that gravity doesn't exist and yet says at the beginning of the lecture, okay, everybody, please be seated, right? It's the same kind of <laughs> yeah. same kind of thing. You know, and of course, I pulled out the Hitler card, which is always a, 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 a good one, you know? Well, that and was way back in it. the, uh, what year was but, that? That was like the, what, like the 70s, maybe? It, like I, the 1870s, yeah, it was right after the Civil War. That's back before but, people okay. used Hitler as an argument for everything, so... Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, now Hitler's, I mean, yeah, like two and two equals four, I can prove it by bringing up Hitler. But but anyway, uh, but, but I'm trying to imagine now, like, what if people in the classroom had to start raising their hand and saying, hey, well, well, okay, right and wrong do not exist, it's just relative from person to person, is, is it okay if I start cheating on every test now? Um, is it okay if I, yeah, I don't go to class, you know, hey, while you're lecturing, can I go out and steal the stereo out of your car? That's back in the day where you had stereos in cars too. I don't think you do anymore. You just have a phone, right? And a, and a, and a Bluetooth hookup. But yeah, yeah. here's the point though. I mean, here's the point. This professor, and he was a doctor. He was a smart person. This professor was an atheist. And, and in fact, he seemed to be fairly smug in his atheism. He was very bold. He walks into the room. I remember distinctly, right and wrong do not exist. And he even thought he was willing to accept the moral implications of it by saying, hey, look, who are we to judge the Eskimos? You know, grandma, grandpa, send them out in, on the ice. Who, who, who are we to judge? He thought he was willing to accept even the implications. But when pressed on it, you know, when I, in a sense, pressed him. So are you saying, you know, that this is the case? Are you saying he fell apart? So, you know, here he was, someone made in the image and likeness of God who has the moral law written on the tables of his heart, who knows, because he's a human being made in God's image, who knows that right and wrong are real. He knows that morals really do exist. But this so conflicts with his worldview because at the same time, he's asserting that there is no God and there is no moral law and nothing exi exists but particles, you know, interacting and bouncing around with one another. And so he's, he's in that tension that, uh, that Professor John Searle talked about when he said, how do we fit in? How do we fit in? And he, he's trying to find a way to fit in and he can't do it very well. Well, let me wrap this up. The, the approach to apologetics that I'm describing here today, the approach to evangelism is what I call Wizard of Oz apologetics. And that's going to be the title of this series, Wizard of Oz apologetics. And the reason I title it that is that in, instead of presenting positive arguments for God's existence, which you can find everywhere and they're very good. My approach here is more to pull back the curtain on the atheist worldview, on the naturalist worldview, and challenge the atheist to face the logical implications and conclusions of his or her commitment to that worldview. By this approach, what we do is essentially this, Matt. We're gonna enter the worldview of the atheist, that is the one who believes in naturalism, which is usually where people are at, the ones who believe that nothing exists but na but nature. We, we're going to enter that worldview and look around. We're going to do what what's referred to as an internal critique. Walk into that worldview, stay there for a while, look around, and uh, draw out some of the implications uh, of that worldview. What if the universe, we're going to be asking the question in a sense, what if the universe really is what our atheist friend insists that it is, a universe in which there is, Richard Dawkins, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. What would the implications be for the meaning of life? What would the implications be for morality? What would the implications be for the value and worth of human life, dignity? For human rights, what would the implications be? For the sense that we have of ourselves as persons, as subjects, as conscious subjects, what would the implications be for that? What about for free will? And then finally, for the possibility of knowledge. I'll just ask it now. Is knowledge possible in a world in which nothing exists but particles and everything is controlled by physical laws, chemical laws, rather than laws of reason, laws of rationality? Okay, these are the subjects that you and I are going to be thinking about over the course of the coming weeks. And when Dorothy pulled back the curtain on The Wizard of Oz, the spell was broken. And, and, and that's kind of the approach that I have and what I am hoping when I 
talk to someone who doesn't believe in God, is that once the curtains are pulled back, once the worldview is simply exposed for what it really teaches and for what it really implies, my hope is that the person I'm talking to, who I know is the image and likeness of God, <laughs> who I know reflects in his nature, his character in every way, the God who created him, my hope is that the worldview will begin to fall apart. The spell will begin to be broken and it will cause him to think again. And But we'll pick up with that next week. Any final well, words from the maestro? I, well, I was just going to say, I would put the challenge out to any of our uh, believing viewers out there to live as if your worldview were true and follow the natural implications. Like, <laughs> what if you did really follow the natural implications of what you were saying in point two, that the atheist with whom you are discoursing really is made in the image and likeness of God. Like, how would you treat them if that really were true, right? <laughs> you know, would you treat them merely as an argument to be won or a problem would be sol to be solved, or would you treat them as someone, you know, infinitely loved by an infinite God uh, in the course of this, instead of just descending into whatever it is that is in the YouTube comment sections on various things, because that's you know, you, what that is. You kind of tricked me there, because because when you started talking, I thought you were going to say, uh, let let's flip the tables around. You who are you who do believe in God and who are Catholics, what if you were to live in, in total consistency with your own worldview, with what you believe to be true? Well, then we'd all be saints, Ken. Yeah. <laughs> we'd all be saints. Yeah, which is the goal, yeah. I suppose. Well, uh, if you want okay. to continue this conversation, and bear in mind, before the comments get churning. We are barely scratching the surface of this, and we put a whole yeah. bunch of disclaimers on the beginning of this episode as well. But please do come say hello to us, uh, not only in the comments on here, but also in the online community, chnetwork.org, and then specifically click the connect button or just type in community.chnetwork.org and come visit us in the online community. Ken Hensley, thanks so much. Have a great day. Good to see you again. Great day. Bye.